The sheer scale of London makes traveling difficult, even though a vast transport network serves its 600 square miles. Extensions of the underground railways stretch out like tentacles into the countryside. Nearly seven million people live in London. One million commute to work in the center every day, most of them by train or bus. Less than one in five central London commuters travel by car. Yet road traffic and the motorways are a constant intrusion into the daily lives of Londoners. London had problems even before transport was mechanized. From the 18th century, it covered almost too great an area to be crossed on foot, and only the rich had horses. There seemed to be room for any number of new ideas and inventions in transport, but in practice, the scope for successful experiment was limited. Until the end of the 19th century, there was no authority capable of encouraging or regulating the use of innovation. New forms of transport and new services were introduced in a hodgepodge way. They didn't have to fit into an overall plan for the city. There wasn't one. The piecemeal transport network that resulted is the basis of the system Londoners use today. In Victorian London, the railway companies built stations on what was then the edge of the city. To carry travellers into the centre, people were eventually won over to the ingenious idea of putting railways underground. The railways were built by the cut and cover method. Just below street level, a trench was dug and then roofed over. The world's first underground railway ran from Farringdon to Paddington, now part of today's Circle Line. It opened in 1863. Improvements in electric traction at the turn of the century made it possible to run trains 100 feet or more beneath the city, much too deep for steam engines. As the tunnels were bored, they were lined with steel ribs, creating the tubes along which the tracks would be laid. The underground railways were built by competing companies, just like the overground railways. Differences in the liveries were obviously less important for trains that were hidden in tunnels away from public view, so each company concentrated on making its station stand out by distinctive design. Several of the underground companies eventually amalgamated in 1902 to form the Underground Electric Railways Company of London. Road transport was little faster than walking pace. Apart from two large firms, Thomas Tilling and Pickford's, most freight firms were small, running a handful of vehicles. In the early 1900s, the London General Omnibus Company had emerged as the leading operator of horse buses. In less than 20 years, horses were replaced. By then, the electric trams run by London County Council already played an important part in the city's transport. Motor buses, like horse buses, were privately owned. A period of chaotic competition was brought to an end by the 1924 London Traffic Act. This favored large operators like the General Omnibus Company, which was by then part of a transport empire brought together by Lord Ashfield. The next step forward was public control. When the Labour government of 1929 was formed, the Prime Minister invited me to become the Minister of Transport, which included electricity. And I readily accepted, and it was one of the most interesting jobs of my life. And during the time that I was there, I was able to reconcile uh, Lord Ashfield's wish to get a big concern and diminish, at any rate, very substantially the competition which was holding things up with my own view that if you did that then if the undertaking was to have the most freedom that you could give it you would have to have it as a public concern and therefore it was established as a public corporation. In 1933 London Transport took over as its headquarters the newly built offices of the Underground Railways at 55 Broadway. From here, it controlled the trams, trolleybuses, buses, and the tubes. It was the biggest local transport undertaking in the world.
London Transport commissioned some of the day's most outstanding architects to build stations and to design the interiors. Underground stations and bus stops became immediately recognisable from the logo which London Transport adopted. It began to plan and build new underground railways. But work of this kind was stopped during the war. Public transport had its share of the difficulties. Petrol was rationed and staff were in short supply. Buses were requisitioned to evacuate thousands of children. Underground stations became bomb shelters. After the war, the tubes and buses were packed, but the prospects for expansion were less certain than they had been. In 1948, more people were carried on London transport than in any year before or since. Well, then, in the 1950s, the problems began to mount. Cars began to, began to come off the production lines in ever-increasing numbers. Petrol was derationed, became available again easily. And TV started, and TV in the home took the place of the weekly visit to the cinema or to the theater. And people, when they went shopping, went by, began to go by car. And they went to sports events by car. And the net effect of all this was to reduce quite considerably the amount of off-peak traffic that London Transport was carrying. And the off-peak traffic it uses up the facilities provided for the peak, which would otherwise lie idle for the rest of the day. Now, on the other hand, the work traffic, the passengers traveling at peak hours to go to work, were becoming more and more concentrated into particular times of the day. One of the effects uh, from the greater use of cars was that they were congesting central area roads. People were using their cars to go to work in the central area, and the buses were suffering, and the buses started getting very regular services and what we called losing mileage. That is to say, they had to be turned back short of their real destination. In the 1950s, with Britain experiencing full employment, London Transport found it increasingly difficult to attract staff because of the unsocial hours and low wages. Women had always been employed, but they were kept out of driving and maintenance jobs. London Transport was one of the first employers to attempt to solve its staffing problems by recruiting labour from the West Indies. But at the root of London Transport's problems was that its income wasn't keeping pace with its needs. The system stagnated and failed to keep up with the growth of London. Before the war, the built-up area had expanded considerably and so had the transport system. Although no new lines were built, the existing ones were extended up to and even beyond the nearest developments. For 15 years after the war, London continued to grow, but apart from the extensions to the central and northern lines, which were begun in the 1930s, no major works were undertaken. The new suburbs and satellite towns were served by London transport buses. The service was often poor, and people commuting to London were faced with awkward changes. London Transport had recognised the urgent need to expand its services and had proposed plans for seven new tube lines as early as 1949. But the government was reluctant to sanction the plans. Eventually, it gave the go-ahead in 1962, but for only one line, Route C, 
and the plan was scaled down. Only part of Route C was ever approved. Work started immediately on what we know today as the Victoria Line. It cost 90 million pounds. It was a breakthrough because for the first time the government had agreed to finance a public transport scheme not on the grounds that it would make money, but because it would cut traffic congestion on the roads and reduce overcrowding on other tube lines. The scheme was also part of the government's strategy to reduce unemployment. The route has the advantage of connecting three main British rail stations and of serving several suburbs which previously had no tube link. The final stretch was opened in 1971. Mainly due to the lack of government support, it had taken 23 years to get this one extra tube line from planning stage to completion. Sometimes plans for new roads in London had a long gestation period, but roads were usually treated with more urgency. Well, during the 1950s, a number of problems emerged which couldn't satisfactorily be dealt with by the present administrative arrangements in London. And amongst these was the problem of road traffic, which was growing very rapidly. And so, um, in 1960, a commission was set up to look into the need for administrative change. And as a result of that, in 1966, the Greater London Council was formed. And one of its principal responsibilities was to tackle the problems of highways and traffic in London. One attempt at solving traffic congestion was building wider roads. The London County Council had a one and a quarter million pound plan for building three quarters of a mile of road on the eastern side of Hyde Park. The Hyde Park Boulevard scheme, as it was called, linked Marble Arch in the north with Hyde Park Corner in the south. Park Lane became an eight lane urban freeway connecting two bottlenecks. Plans for building ring roads around and in London had first been mooted before the Second World War. The M25, which is effectively the outermost of these ring roads, now cuts a sway through the countryside around London and is virtually complete. But it was the innermost of the proposed ring roads which provoked the most controversy. The motorway box, as it was called, would have been a devastating six-lane road running at rooftop level around the inner suburbs of London. Well, it was estimated at the time that between two and 3,000 acres of um, land would be required to construct the new motorway systems. But the concern wasn't primarily about the amount of land, which isn't that great by London-wide standards, but by the amount of property that would be taken. The inner motorways, for example, would have taken about 8,000 residential dwellings and the system as a whole, approximately 20,000 houses would have had to have been taken. It was easy to imagine what effects the motorway box would have because of the recent experience of Westway. This road, which was opened in 1970, made life appalling for the people who lived near it. A long-running campaign of protest received widespread publicity. The motorway box was to run through a number of London's more attractive and wealthy areas. On just one curve of the ring road, it would have formed a junction with the busy Finchley Road and would then have cut right through the quiet streets of Belsize Park. The residents of places like this were quick to organise into effective pressure groups. Throughout the 1960s, opposition to the motorway plans mounted. A group called Homes Before Roads contested the 1969 council elections and polled well in the threatened areas. Influenced by the protest, the London Labour Group adopted an anti-motorway stance. In 1973, when the GLC changed from a Conservative administration to a Labour administration, um, a key plank in the political platform of the new Labour administration was the abandonment of the inner motorways and the replacing of the motorway proposals with an alternative transport strategy. But the Labour Group hadn't really worked out the details. And anyway, it had to contend with unsympathetic national governments. The council wanted to improve public transport and held down the fares for two years. But in 1975, it gave in to pressure from the government and raised fares. The result was a loss in passengers 
and this led to further fare rises and to cuts in services. Across the Channel, Paris had approached similar problems rather differently. In the 1950s, the public transport system was old, very run down and close to breaking point. Most of the buses had been built before the war and, like those in London, were beginning to get caught up in increasing traffic congestion. The metro suffered from overcrowding and many of the trains dated from the construction of the metro itself at the turn of the century. More and more people were using cars, but there was no room for the increased traffic. Paris tried to solve its traffic problems by building new motorways. In 1965, Georges Pompidou, the French president, launched a plan for rebuilding the center of Paris around a massive new motorway system. He said Paris must be adapted to the automobile. At the same time, there was confusion on the role of public transport in this motorway city. Money was being invested in new rail links, but simultaneously, the subsidy to public transport was being cut. The fare increases were desperately unpopular, and a coalition of staff and passengers took to the streets, forcing the government to abandon its policy and maintain the cheap fares. After Pompidou's death in 1974, the French government decided to put more emphasis on public transport and extended the new system of high-speed underground lines, the RER. It also began restoring the old metro. It introduced new trains, modernized stations, and extended some of the lines. New buses replaced the old open-back vehicles. All forms of transport were integrated, Travel Pass, the orange card, enable people to change between metro, bus or train, with stations and bus stops sited conveniently. By 1976, Pompidou's motorway plans had been dropped. By contrast, the rundown in London transport continued throughout the 1970s. Tube services were cut back. Traffic conditions got worse. Public transport passengers just had to wait. Unlike Paris, the commuting services run by the National Railway were not integrated with London Transport's underground railways. Although hundreds of thousands of commuters transfer from one to the other every day, there was no through ticketing. The tide seemed to be turning in 1981 when a newly elected GLC launched its plan to improve public transport. The first step was a 33% fares cut. Not only did we want to reduce London transport fares, but we also wanted to reduce British rail fares in line with that and then have a completely integrated system with something like the orange card that was used in um, Paris. And we went and saw the Secretary of State for Transport after we discussed the system with British Rail and they'd agreed to do it. And he made it quite clear to us that if we gave London British Rail the sort of £20 million or so that they'd need to cut their fares in line with our fare cut, he would claw back £20 million worth of government grant to prevent them doing it. So the money was on the table from the moment we won the election for British Rail to cut their fares as well and have a common ticketing system. Um, but it was completely stopped by government at every stage. The Greater London Council became involved in a series of court battles over its cheap fares policy. Bromley Council took it to court and the House of Lords ruled that the cheap fares were illegal. The Greater London Council was forced to double its fares. In the second court battle, the council won the right to make a 25% fares reduction. With the cuts, it launched a zonal fare system as a first step towards integration and introduced the travel card. 
This was a great advance. The card was valid on both the buses and tubes, and at last did away with the need to buy separate tickets. But it couldn't be used on British Rail services. On both the occasions that we cut fares, the immediate response was a big increase in the number of people using the system, um, a reduction in traffic congestion, um, less accidents on the roads and less deaths. The second occasion, which had much longer to run because we had a year between the fares cut and the loss of LT to the government, we saw 16% more usage of the system and 8 to 9% less cars on the streets of London during the rush hour, 3,000 less accidents and clearly less deaths, at least in double figures and possibly more. While London Transport was under GLC control, fares were cut and services increased. Many of the central stations were upgraded with improvements in service information and newly decorated interiors. During the 1980s, passengers were being won back onto London Transport. But in July 1984, the government removed London Transport from the GLC. I think the government's move to take London Transport away from the GLC was purely political. Um, everybody who's a sort of academic in the planning and transport world accepted the need for one authority to oversee planning and transportation and road policy for London and taking London Transport away was, I think, an important first step in the government's attempt to abolish us. It took away our most popular single policy. Since the government removed London Transport from the control of the GLC, the buses and tube fares have gone up by 9%. The fare rises reduced the possible appeal of the combined travel card, which London Transport and British Rail eventually introduced. Bus services have already been cut. Some tube stations may close permanently when the ageing lifts need replacing. The result is crowded and unattractive public transport and a long wait if you've just missed the bus. Discouraged from using public transport, people have been taking to their cars. I think what's important is having shown that for the first time since the 1950s, you could increase the use of the public transport system. You could end that spiral of decline and start to get a spiral of growth. Um, that even if there is a sort of temporary setback with the government that doesn't share that perspective, having so clearly demonstrated the policies could work and you could shift people back onto public transport in a large urban environment, then eventually another government of a different colour is going to go back to that policy. So we may have lost a battle, but we've won the war because we actually demonstrated it could be done and we won the hearts and minds of Londoners um, to that policy. And more important, perhaps, because of that, we won the commitment of a large proportion of the Labour Party, which had never been terribly concerned before about public transport in Parliament. And now the party is firmly committed to public transport in a way it hasn't been for nearly half a century. about the topics covered in this series, there's a book called Losing Track by Kerry Hamilton and Stephen Potter, which is available in bookshops at £7.95 in paperback.
Tomorrow here on 4, a major new series explores the way in which doctors and scientists approach the long-term goal of eradicating infectious diseases from the face of the earth. The first program looks at the steps taken in diagnosing a unique illness infecting a remote tribe in Papua New Guinea and the story of medical detection that led investigators to the other side of the world and a link with premature senility. Medical science and the efforts to wipe disease from the face of the earth a new series starting tomorrow at 8, here on 4. On ITV in a couple of minutes, there's music and giggles in a new series called Funny Side. Here on 4 after the break, Diverse Reports offers its interpretation of the truth behind the Bulgarian fantasy, the alleged plot to kill the Pope. Easy on me. Available at W.H. Smith, Underwoods, Asda, John Menzies and leading chemists and stores. Electrolux introduced the classic collection of fridges and freezers. 21 sizes and shapes in a range of colors, all finished to the highest of standards. The classic collection. See them at your Electrolux dealer and ask about the trade-ins. Most dealers can offer up to 20 pounds on fridge freezers. Goodyear Technology has developed an important new tire, the GT. The GT maintains its grip by an impressive ability to disperse water. The new GT inherits the famous Goodyear grip in all conditions, but with even greater stopping power on wet or slippery roads. We asked experienced driver Sir Harry Seacombe what he thought of the new GT. Most impressive. You can sense the extra grip, especially when you break in the wet. Very reassuring. Goodyear, a world leader in tyre technology. Anglia Television sell TV advertising for ITV1 and Channel 4. TV advertising can be effective for you. To find out more, please call Anglia Sales on this number. A computer dealer should be someone you can trust, someone who's a hardware expert, a software consultant, a business advisor, a planner, a service engineer, a financial advisor, an analyst. He should be a businessman, like yourself. No wonder only a small proportion of dealers earn our stripes. For your nearest IBM authorized dealer, phone 01200 0200. Hi. <laughs> Got a new one for you, Bronski. What is it with you Eastern guys? Another city? Ain't 141 enough. You fly more people than TWA. You got more planes than Pan Am. And I got a bad back. Come on, Bronski. This one's special. Oh, pardon me. Flying to the North Pole now, huh? No. London. London, England? I always wanted to go to London. Say, that's a terrific suit, sir. You mind if I call you, sir? You know, only last night, I was saying to Mrs. Brown... On July the 17th, London joins the most extensive airline network in the entire Americas. Eastern Airlines, London to Miami and beyond. A new series begins this Saturday on Channel 4. Nature in Focus takes a close look at the tiny creatures which live all around us. Oh, there's something calling you with a pyramid. Oh, what is it? Ants. Oh, I wonder what they do when they get down there. I wonder what is really down there. It'd be good if we could see, wouldn't it? So what would you do if your picnic were invaded by ants? 
You take them home, of course. Nature in Focus shows you how and tells you why. This Saturday at 1 o'clock on Channel 4. You're watching Channel 4. Now, diverse reports. Rome. Mehmet Ali Adja, the man who shot the Pope in 1981, gives evidence in what has been called the trial of the century. Adja claims he was a hired assassin for the Bulgarian Secret Service. The British Foreign Office agrees. They've said so in private briefings. <laughs> Tonight's diverse report shows there's no reliable evidence against the Bulgarians. Our reporter Christopher Hurd argues what's going on in the Italian courtroom is a show trial. Pope John Paul II makes his weekly appearance in St. Peter's Square. A spiritual leader of one-fifth of the world's population, the Pope is an obvious target for terrorists. Four years ago, when he was shot by Ali Ajka, all the media agreed on Ajka's motive. Ali Ajka was on the run from a Turkish jail after killing the editor of a liberal newspaper in Turkey. He was a member of the fascist Grey Wolves, some of whose members see the Pope as leading a Christian crusade against them. Indeed, Ajka had written a detailed letter to a Turkish paper in 1979 telling them he was going to kill the Pope. But some months after Ajka carried out his threat, Thames Television's TVI started to push the story in another direction, away from the Turkish Mafia and towards the Eastern Bloc. Then, in the wake of further press reports of a Bulgarian connection, and 18 months after he pulled the trigger, Ajka started to talk. On the basis of his testimony alone, these three men are now on trial. Former assistant to the Bulgarian military attaché in Rome, Zelio Vasilev. Todor Ivazov, a cashier at the embassy. Sergei Antonov, a Bulgarian national airline official in Rome, and the only one of the three currently in custody. Ajka's story, a potent weapon in the Cold War, has been keenly supported in the media. Programmes like Newsnight have also put the Bulgarians squarely in the frame. Enthusiasts for the Bulgarian connection say that the Soviet Union wanted to kill the Polish Pope because he was the spiritual leader of the growing opposition in his home country. It's hard to see how murdering the Pope could possibly help the Kremlin. But never mind the details, on with the story. Sofia, capital of Bulgaria, the most inflexible police state in Eastern Europe, but also the hub of the Turkish Mafia. The Vitosha Hotel. From hotels such as this, a group of rich Turks run an international drug smuggling and arms dealing business. Their partners, the Turkish Grey Wolves. On the run from Turkish justice, Ajka sought refuge with the Turkish Mafia. One day that summer, he came to a meeting here, like any other room in any other hotel. But the talk that day was assassination. The Bulgarians were willing to pay, fix up a false passport, and find a gun. Rome, four months later, Ajka makes his first contact with his Bulgarian accomplices. Over the months, they meet in squares and bars throughout the city. With their confidence rising, Ajka is even introduced to the Bulgarians' families. A getaway car is arranged on the day of the shooting, but Ajka never made it. He was felled by a nearby nun. 
Ajka supported this story with a wealth of detail, which seemed to check out. But as the last six weeks have shown, many of the details are wrong. Ajka is losing his credibility and the judge his patience. All this is to the obvious delight of the lawyers defending the Bulgarians, two of whom are being tried in their absence.